talking about loudspeakers, uh, loudspeakers come in all kinds of sizes. You know, this is a normal human being here. This speaker is almost the height of a person, and then there are small speakers, small monitor speakers. Typically, they are box speakers. They're essentially all built the same, and the result is that they essentially all sound the same. There isn't much difference, and the problem is... Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I will be turning a lot to this, this direction, okay? Let's do it this way, okay? And uh, we'll get into uh, some of the details here of that later. Uh, the problem, first problem is that speakers are typically designed for a listening window. You know, you are supposed to sit at the sweet spot and then a little bit to the left and the right of it, and uh, uh, it's all happening in the horizontal plane, maybe a little bit in the vertical plane. So while the speaker may be radiating all over every direction here from its center, uh, the designer only works for this part. The result is that uh, when you have Listen to these speakers, you, yeah, you get a nice stereo image between the speakers. Usually it's very hard bounded. You are also usually aware that you are sitting in a living room and you, you complain that my room is not as good as somebody else's room because you have to do some room treatment or try to cure it. And if you happen to sit off axis over on the side, uh, the sound collapses into the nearest speakers here and the whole scene uh, basically disappears or, or collapses into the closest speaker to you. So that's a general problem with, with loudspeakers. So now let's talk about something very fundamental. This is not optics, but it's uh, not acoustics, but, but you could say optics or the visual. Uh, we know the sun is there to illuminate everything. And since we are human beings and have eyes, we can perceive our surroundings. If the sun were turned off, if it's dark at night, uh, you have a difficulty to know where you are and, and, uh, and uh, get any reflection from, from the landscape, the trees, and, and the forest. Uh, the sun allows us to know where we are, and that's a very important thing. Now, when we go to loudspeakers, the loudspeaker is not like the sun, but uh, there is actually information coming out of the loudspeaker. A song is being sung or somebody is speaking. But there is also usually a room or a reflecting environment, and there are reflections. And those reflections are important for us to know where is this source located in the room. That's an old survival uh, 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 requirement, you know, from evolutionary speaking, you needed to know where the uh, saber-toothed tiger was, was hiding, and if there were little ticks and noises, you wanted to figure out where do they come from and not be distracted by the reflections of those noises. So between the ears in our brain, we develop a highly uh, sophisticated uh, signal analysis system that uh, even today with DSP, we're still very far from being able to duplicate the, uh, the amazing spatial resolution and, and time resolution that uh, the brain is capable of. Okay, so that enough about optics. Now let's talk about, wait a moment, where do I aim this thing? There. Talk about light just for a moment. Oh, let's skip that. Uh, let's, let's stick with acoustics. Okay. And uh, acoustics, I have, I have a red ball here. Okay. See this ball? This, the basic acoustic radiator, is like a ball that is pulsating, you know, that is going shrinking and expanding, you know, pulsating. It's a perfect omnidirectional source, okay? And that uh, when you look in the, into the physics more closely, a breathing sphere is a monopole, it's omnidirectional. That's a picture on the left there. The uh, next way 
that this thing could oscillate is you know, oscillate like this or like this or like this here, right? The surfaces of the thing. Yeah. And then you have a dipole. And that's the oscillating sphere or a dipole, which is bidirectional. Those are two basic, uh, uh, the, the first two basic uh, uh, types of, of uh, oscillators. And then there is a third way, and there are actually many more ways that the surface of this, this sphere might vibrate. If I pressure on both sides, it would bulge out in the middle. The, the ends would get pulled together. Well, that's called the uh, second order uh, radiator. As a matter of fact, all these different oscillating modes that a sphere has, the surface on a sphere has, uh, are called spherical harmonics. You have heard about the, the uh, Fourier transform and how you can represent a uh, square wave by a multitude of odd harmonics, you know, individual sine waves that are all add up to a square wave. Well, in acoustics and in space, if you take these spherical harmonics or these spherical different radiators, any sound field, three-dimensional sound field, can be like a Fourier analysis, be decomposed in the sum of multiples of these radiators, different for each frequencies. And that's actually something that's used uh, today uh, to, to measure very large and complex loudspeaker systems and predict their far field radiation, which otherwise would be difficult to measure in practice. Okay? So that's enough about theory. So we have the basic omnidirectional radiator radiates each direction. This would be in the vertical plane. Here would be the horizontal plane. This would be 45 degree plane. This uh, here would be the rear side. But it's always, you would always have the same strengths coming to you. You know, that's the nice characteristics of a, of a, a spherical radiator. You know, so you could rotate the thing like this. Radiates the same way in each direction. Now, if we look at the uh, oscillating sphere, uh, it's bidirectional. And that one, let's see, where did I, oops, it's upside down. But you have like, like two tennis balls, OK? So right now, you see the bore side radiation pattern here. Here, you're looking at the null of the radiation pattern, OK? I could also do it like this. You're still looking at the null, right? And, and here, you're looking at the bore side, or here, you sit off axis of this thing here, OK? But it's, it's important thing, it's rota rotation <laughs> symmetrical, OK? So radiates not just in one plane, but in all planes. Very important to keep in mind. So, so no, a spherical radiator usually isn't built with a, with a round ball, but we take a little piston driver, stick it in a box. So you have the, here this box, and when this, this driver is radiating long wavelengths, you know, these circles are one wavelength apart. So that the wavelength is large to any of the dimensions of this box. Then it doesn't matter whether you make the box round or with five corners or six or whatever. It's omnidirectional. As long as the wavelength is uh, long compared uh, to the driver. And so, say at some point out here, you measure a sound pressure level of zero dB. Now let's do the thing and take this radiator and put it into a baffle 
an infinite baffle, okay? A baffle that is large compared to the wavelength that's radiated, and of course large to our little source here, okay? Well, what happened to the sound pressure level that before was zero dB? Now it has doubled because we are only radiating into this half of, of the world here, you know? It's only half, half space radiated, so you have plus 6 dB. Okay, that's interesting and very important to keep in mind because next question is, what happens if we make the baffle not infinite, but make it some finite length? So at long wavelengths, it's still sort of small compared to the wavelengths. But at short wavelengths, which I've drawn here in green, it's many, many wavelengths in size. So we know when we look in terms of the frequency response, at long wavelengths or low frequencies, we get zero dB out here. At infinite baffle, we get plus six dB. And so maybe for these short wavelengths, this looks like an infinite baffle, so it should aim towards plus 6 dB higher SPL level. And then there must be a transition between these and this level and this level. You get the idea? You know, I call it a baffle step because that's a <coughs> common expression that's uh, used. And so let's look at that thing, and we have to go back in time to Bell Labs, 1938, Mueller, Black, and Davis. They were, as far as I know, the first ones to do a real theoretical analysis of this baffle step. They took a cylinder here, round cylinder. They took a square box, and they took a sphere and they calculated, and keep in mind, this is 1938, no electronic computers, but hand crank computers, big sheets of paper, enormous numbers uh, 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 of pages of calculation to figure out what is the on-axis frequency response and all the different angles at different different uh, angles. And you see the smoothest response if you have a small point source sitting here in the sphere. You see the transition from 0 dB to 6 dB on axis is getting rather smooth. Of course, off axis, the response falls off. I think this is really significant work. I, it's been quoted many times. Uh, I find it sad that Olson in his big book on acoustics, he shows these pictures, but never gives a reference of these guys, you know, who, who did the original work. Uh, so that, this here has been state of the art for a long time. And uh, if, I, if I take, you know, one, one case here, the square box, and uh, I put actual frequency numbers on it, and I just go this first region up to 1.3 kilohertz here, and say, well, I don't want this baffle step in here. I equalize it to be flat. Then what is the response going to be? And you see here is the square box with the baffle step just redrawn. I redrew the, the thing. When you flatten it, you see flat on axis, and here is the off-axis response now of that square box with the point source in the center of the box. Now, it was actually uh, 2012 that a book came out by Leo Beranek and Tim Mello. Beranek, I'm sure you all have heard about, very famous uh, in acoustics. And Tim Mello, a younger engineer, British engineer, who actually was deeply into mathematics, and he basically did this work that uh, the Bell Labs people did years ago on a modern computer and recalculated. 
and found out what the exact curves are here. And here, in this case, it's drawn for a, uh, a uh, uh, cylinder, you know, a, 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 uh, how should I say, a uh, piston, you know, of this diameter. And this piston is either by itself or has a baffle around it that increases, doubles in diameter all the time. And you see, when you have the bare piston, of course, there is a tube behind it, so it's, it's really like acting like a monopole. You get this response here, this dark curve, okay? When you add baffle, it gets more violent, and if you have a really dark, long, long baffle, you get wild gyrations in the response. And this is precisely calculated now. But again, for case assuming a, a perfect piston here, which our drivers never are, and, uh, and uh, so this is also only really a theoretical approach. Uh, and the reason why these curves are so difficult to uh, calculate is that uh, if you have this box here, and you have a point source, and again, we're just talking about a point source. It's radiating. When the radiation comes to the edge, ob obviously the space expands now, okay? Here it was half space up to this point. And there it expands into full space, so the sound pressure drops, and it's as if you had at this corner a new wave starting to be excited, okay? This new wave, or this original wave in red, when it gets to the back edge here, again, there is uh, the space that it can expand into is increasing even more. And so here again is a compensating wave, uh, negative of negative pressure emanating. Now, people, uh, in, but you cannot stop at this point because the diffraction at this edge, of course, expands out and hits this edge, where again it is diffracted and changes pressure. And when it comes around to here, it, it's affected. So it's an iterative problem, and which makes the calculation extremely difficult. Added to that now, is the fact that we don't have perfect pistons or point sources in reality, but that when you have a real cone driver, that the cone at very low frequencies, it may act like a piston, move uniformly all at once. But as you go up in frequency, you get nodes, and then you get multiple uh, nodes of uh, different parts of the cone move in different relationship to each other. Locally, they may cancel, and in the far field, you never see it, but some will add, in particular, off-axis, they will add. So it gets very complicated. Okay. Next. So here is a real measurement of a small three-inch driver and I put it in the end of a pipe, and I measured the response, and this was part of a little speaker pair that I built for some experimentation. And you see at low frequencies, uh, no matter what angle the microphone, this is a microphone, no matter what angle the microphone is at, it's always the same response, so it's omni, omnidirectional there. Certainly in the horizontal plane, yeah, just because of symmetry. But then, then, see here, it begins to, and this here is at uh, uh, 90 degrees here, the top curve. See how it begins to beam. And then, as you go on further down, it changes like this. So this is a real world, really. That's what we are dealing with. So I take a very dim view of, of uh, some of the uh, software programs that I've seen on the internet which talk about baffle and baffle shapes and edge diffraction and all this stuff because they're just so simplified. The analysis is so simplified. 
that uh, the practical usefulness of these things is, is very limited. Okay, now here is a, a speaker that I designed, it's a Pluto, it's an earlier design, where I have an upward facing woofer here and a forward facing tweeter. And the woofer, and the crossover was, uh, in this case, I think around a kilohertz or something like this. So at that frequency, the woofer here is still quite omnidirectional. And it crosses over to the tweeter, which again, it's a two and a half inch dome tweeter. And that one also is omni. So you're combining an omni with an omni here. And uh, uh, you might say, why, why is it offset here from the center? Why is it not in the center? Well, if I tried it first, putting it right in the center, but then this surface below the tweeter here is reflecting and it messes up the on-axis frequency response. So I move the tweeter to the front edge and then electrically delay, delay the sound to the tweeter here so that it coincides with a vertical, vertical symmetry axis here, okay? So it's, it's a nice point source, and here you see the horizontal frequency response. Of course, at higher frequencies, again, it begins to get directional. And in the vertical, there is more of a change in directivity because of the distance from here to there, okay? This is in the upside and the downside. How do I get back? How do I get back to questions? Is it time for questions? <laughs> Not yet. Is that where you want to start? No, I want I want one. I don't want to have all this stuff here on the left hand yeah, side. Okay. Which slide do you want? Uh, I want no. to have, uh, let's see, let's, let, let me go to the slide. I want to have that one there. this slide. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, now here's a newer version of uh, the Pluto. Still the upward firing woofer, which is omnidirectional, but what sits up here is a dipole. See, there is a, it's just a bare driver that you're looking at edge on. So it radiates to the front and in opposite polarity to the back. And then in between, it has, has a, a no. And here you see actually, and again, this comes from the Baranek Mellon book. You see, if, if this was a piston, you see the radiation pattern, which starts out as uh, this, half, this circle here, where it's on log scale, so it's distorted. And then you see as frequency goes up, it gets narrower, and then even gets, gets too low. Or in a more familiar way, looking at it, here is the on-axis response, and here are the different off-axis responses from 0 to 30, 45, 60, and 75 degrees. This is, this is essentially an oscillating plate, you know, oscillating plate, where the baffle here has been removed. So we have just the plate, and it turns out that no baffle is the best baffle. Okay, if you want a smooth frequency response, don't put any baffle on your driver. Uh, all right. Okay, here's some more detail. All right, here's an interesting point. This here is an omni. This unit up here, the higher frequencies, it's dipole. And I have a crossover at about 800 hertz. When you combine an omni with a dipole, which you see here, this is the omni, this large circle, and the dipole is a small circle. Here, in the forward direction, the dipole is positive. Rearward direction, the dipole is negative. In the forward direction, meaning this way here, the two add. 
all right, in output. In this direction, the two cancel if they have the same magnitude of output. And so the resulting response is that you get a, what is called a cardioid frequency response, which is wider than an omni, uh, but it doesn't change polarity to the back. You know, it's wider than an omni, uh, wider than a dipole, but less so than an omni. And when you look at the total power radiated into the room, you know, radiated into all directions, if the omni is zero, let's call it zero dB, then the dipole, because it has this null, it has this direction where it doesn't radiate, it radiates less power into the room. As a matter of fact, it radiates only one third of the power of an omni, which is minus 4.8 dB in dB scales. And as it turns out, maybe somewhat surprisingly, the uh, cardioid also has the same one third or minus 4.8 dB total power into the room, okay? So there's no power step in that sense between a dipole and a cardioid. And when we look at the frequency response of this arrangement here, this is in the forward hemisphere and it's too difficult to you, for you to see from the distance uh, all the details here, but what I want to point out in the rear direction radiating backwards here, you can see here, here is this null where omni and dipole cancel each other. And here, here you have the perfect cardioid. And then, then above this frequency, the dipole takes over. And I have this body behind this dipole. And the body is there so that I get a reflection on this edge and on that edge of the rear radiation, which means that the sound is scattered. So it doesn't radiate nice and smoothly towards the back, but it scatters the sound. And the idea here is that this speaker may be in a small room, maybe close to a wall, and I don't want to illuminate the wall behind it smoothly, evenly, I want to scatter this, that sound in the room. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to absorb it. I want to have the sound power in the room, okay? Oops, yeah, there. So, when you do all this, what you end up with is a uh, uh, very wide, like in this case here, in this, this Alex Mini speaker, and also in the Pluto, uh, a very wide dispersion loudspeaker. And it's not just this design window that matters, but also the sound going into all directions. The effect is that you sit here and listen you have a sound stage which is not hard bounded by the speakers, but it spreads smoothly between the speakers and beyond. The room, which was in the typical box speaker design, always a large element of reproduction, is essentially out of the picture here. And if you sit off axis, then yes, the scene, the auditory scene scrunches towards the nearer speaker, but it's still spread between the speakers. It doesn't collapse into the nearest speakers. And all of that is because in our hearing, we do not just hear the direct sound coming to us, but also the sound that has been reflected by the room from the different walls. And if that sound that is being reflected has the same character, the same timbre, the same spectral content, <coughs> like the direct sound, then our brain, and here we come back to evolution, our brain can say, ah, yeah, I'm in a, in a room of a certain size. I, I'm familiar with this. 
I can essentially ignore it mentally and just focus on the direct sound, which creates this illusion of a spread of some acoustic scene between the loudspeakers. And, and, and it works quite, quite effectively there. Now, in the traditional way of building loudspeakers, where you have high directivity at the high end, and let me show you how are we on time. Oh, we have a good time. Uh, I show you radiation pattern. Oops. Can, can you see this? I'll hold it up. Here is, here is a box speaker, OK? And say this is the horizontal plane, even though I hold it vertically, right? This is a horizontal plane. Uh, at low frequencies, it radiates all around. Okay, then as the frequency increases, the wavelengths become shorter. The, it doesn't radiate as effectively anymore towards the backside. So this thing here pulls in. Okay, and then as frequency goes up even further, it just radiates to the front. It doesn't even see the edge anymore. So if you have a five-inch drive or something there, it doesn't see see the edge. Then you come in and say, OK, one driver doesn't do it. I need a second driver, a tweeter. Now the tweeter, of course, it starts out because it's a small drive unit, small compared to the wavelength. It radiates very wide, OK? So you're trying to compare very, combine very wide dispersion with a narrow dispersion of the woofer, which as far as the sound in the room is concerned, it puts in a, a dip in the power response. Now, when you look at modern loudspeakers, you often see that uh, people put a, uh, a, uh, a uh, dish-type structure in front of the tweeter to make it narrow at the low frequencies so that the transition isn't so strong between the narrowness of the woofer to the wide dispersion of the tweeter. The effect, of course, is that the total power into the room keeps decreasing, goes down, okay? And perceptibly, if it's done in the extreme, like you find in uh, coaxial, where, where the put a tweeter in the center of a woofer in a coaxial speaker. Uh, they make this transition very nice and smoothly. You don't really see it. But the effect of this narrowing is that you act essentially what I describe, build yourself headphones at a distance. Now, some people very much like that kind of sound. I personally don't. Uh, I have to admit that I also don't like uh, listening to headphones because I don't like everything playing between the ears and behind my forehead. I can't get it out of the head. You know, it's, it's just not an enjoyable experience. I sometimes listen to headphones because uh, it's very analytical. If you want to know something about the recording or so, you can easily tell with headphones, much more difficult often with, with loudspeakers. But for just enjoyment, particularly of music, I think wide dispersion is the only way to go. OK? I think that's essentially what I have to say. And thank you for your attention. And we have, we have some time for questions. And I did build myself a little box loudspeaker. Okay. Because I thought <laughs> because and, and actually it's open in the back, so it's not, <laughs> not a sealed box, okay? So imagine there is a box there. But oh but I thought if we have the time it's very uh, illustrative to look at all the flaws that come 
with box loudspeakers. So feel free to ask me questions if you have any, or if everything is clear, then fine. Question, yeah. In your, in your measurement apparatus that you yeah. have shown, you showed that the, uh, that the angle that you measured from yeah. was offset by Oh, yeah, interesting point. Interesting point. Let's see, I have to go back to that slide. Oh, whoops, there it was. There. Yeah. Uh, you see, all these angles go to this point, which is in front of the cone. This is actually the uh, geometric center of this source. It's in front of the cone. If you look at the radiation pattern, see, in that case, if I refer everything to this point, then at low frequencies, it's truly omni, which you know it has to be. It has to be omni, OK? And then it spreads out. And uh, actually, it wasn't that long ago that John van der Koy, uh, wrote a paper on this where he extrapolated the uh, far field response to the equivalent point source, and it is always in front of the actual physical, physical source. Okay? It's one of these things, you know. Yeah. So when you showed that uh, spherical dapple where it was uh, smoothly respond, have yes. you explored using that, or does the tube uh, emulate that? Uh, let's see. You, you know what I'm getting at? Can you use the, the driver in the tube rather than? Oh, which, which one are you referring to? Uh, at the very beginning, the theoretical curve okay. with a flat a square baffle, a round baffle, and uh, these here? This work? Yeah. Did you explore using that spherical baffle when you were doing your um, tests? And, uh, uh, like here? Like this is a, one, the oh, this is a, a sphere with, right. a, with a small source. Now, uh, the response is so smooth. In your research and stuff, did you explore like, putting the driver in the spherical, in the, in part of, like in the spherical right. baffle? Right. Yeah, I haven't done it. Other people have done it. And, and yes, indeed, it is, gives you this, this smooth type response. What other people have done, and actually, Lyman, you did this, right? Lyman actually built a sphere and put many, many small drivers. How many drivers did you put on there? 20, 20 small drivers on a sphere. And you would think, well, now I have created this ball. You know, this, that, that I showed you? Well, not quite. At higher frequencies, there's still a distance between even when he uses 20 drivers. And so when you go off axis, you get interference. So this, this, uh, the radiation is more like the sun, or like people draw the sun, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> things like that, right? At low frequencies, yeah, very nicely. But as you get higher and you get what's called spatial aliasing, uh, the distance between the drivers gets too large and then you get nodes, you, know, you get lobes and you get nodes in between. Does that answer the question? Well, what if you just have the one driver in a spherical Yeah, that, that works. Yeah. Yeah, do this, but, but, but the sphere is hard to build. And I think there were some commercial speakers there. Yeah. There is, uh, what's the name? Gallo. Hmm? Gallo. Builds, builds something like this. So there is, I mean, there is definitely something to it, you know. Take a look at the uh, bottom axis. It's the dry, diameter versus lambda wavelength. Yeah. So you're going to have to keep that in mind. So you just have to set it up. Yeah, look yeah. at this. This is the diameter to wavelengths here. The diameter is one tenth of a wavelength here. That's where it's nice and omni and above that. Oh, so it has to be everything. Yeah, 
It's really big. And I, I, I took a 10.5-inch diameter sphere or 10.5-inch diameter sphere here. And, and these are the actual frequencies. So this would be here at 130 hertz. It pretty much stops. Yeah. So okay. it's either being a bunch of big ones. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's, it's practical things that always get you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned this uh, psychoacoustic, so that we, as a human, we perceive sound over through, through like reflection, so we can localize things. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, so you kind of try to just reproduce this by having like a very good uh, off axis response of your loudspeaker. Um, may I ask the reason why you chose like this dipole uh, and or like cardioid um, operation that you choose at the end? Yeah, OK. OK, I have to come back to this box now here. Yeah. One of the big problems with a thing like this, you know, however you build it, is that you do not just get sound from the woofer driver and the tweeter driver, OK? But these walls, they all radiate, OK? And they actually are much responsible for the sort of the characteristic box sound. Now, if you're very elaborate, you build these things out of hogum, out of solid aluminum or so, you can do a pretty good job. But you still have this woofer driver, well, which also shows up on the inside of the box. So it's compressing and rarefying air inside the box. Well, maybe the box is strong enough so it doesn't move the walls, but the energy is not dissipated, right? We, we have not found a good uh, acoustic resistor to turn the acoustics into heat. So it basically comes out in some form, usually in resonant form, because you have finite dimensions here, comes back out through the front again. I have worked so much with, with boxes, tried everything from building it as stiff as I could, you know, like having bracing everywhere so that it's, everything was stiff, okay? Uh, tedious to build, not, not very easy. Uh, works so-so, okay? Uh, then I actually thought, well, let's not try to build, push up the stiffness so much because it moves everything just to higher frequencies. Uh, I said, make it as limp as possible because, because you, you, your hand, your, your skin is pretty dead, right? If you tap on it, not much is coming back. So I said, well, take thin plywood which in itself is not that great. But then I put layers of tar, roofing tar, on the inside, OK? And that works actually quite well. But it has a problem. The problem is, one, that it smells. <laughs> <laughs> the other problem is that roofing tar never is really, is not solid, because if it were solid, it would damp. So after a while, all this star rolls down. <laughs> it's, it's in a big puddle down below. Okay. Okay. Oh, and speaking of below, see this thing here? You find something like this, a slot, or, or a round hole in the back called a vent. And the idea is, see here, I put in a, a shelf. So there is a volume of air trapped down here, OK? And when this, the woofer driver is moving, this large volume of air acts like a spring. So you have a spring pushing a plug of air or mass, OK? You have a spring mass resonator. And I would say, 90% of all loudspeakers out there today use this concept to get a little bit more bass, okay? Because you put the resonance, 
below the resonance of this driver in the box, and it seems like you get more bass. I find you now have bass all the time <laughs> because, because you have a resonance structure in here. And once you excite it, it goes boing, boing. And if there's real bass coming from it, which may, may have a first ding, but then it gets captured by this resonator, so it slides, actually spectrally slides, and assumes the frequency of this resonator, if this resonator is really effective in giving you more bass or punch or whatever people. OK, are we done on time? We're at uh, 1.45, so maybe one more. One question? Yeah. One more question. Better be a good one. <laughs> On, on no, you're referring to <coughs> yeah, the cylinder we built. Yeah, the cylinder back there. Uh, no, 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 no. The, the back cylinder is actually a diffuser, a scattering body, because I want to sort of randomize the sound direction in the back. Because you only, it only gets to you via reflection from the room. It's not coming to you directly. But I don't want to lose the energy. I want the energy in the room, because it adds to the reverberant field and maintains the neutrality of the reverberant field. Now, I don't do it on the, the big speakers, the uh, LX521. Uh, I assume that you, that speaker only goes into a large room, that you have plenty of space behind the speaker. I say at, at least a, a meter, three feet at least, behind it. So that the radiation back there, it gets sort of randomized by itself. Okay? All right. So no more any of these. <laughs> <laughs> was, there, was there pointing? Yes? Yes. Being in front of the woofer a couple of inches yeah. is the center. But uh, that's not that's frequency response that you're speaking to, not time alignment. No. Right? Frequency response. Yeah. If you want to get the frequency, it's it's part of because the the uh, <laughs> the near field how in very close proximity to the cone things Take take a bit to to form properly, you know. But the, the time response is is where the motors are. Well, the uh, the time response again here is is uh, another thing, you know. You want to align the tweeter and the woofer, so acoustically speaking, when I measure out here at at exactly the crossover frequency the signal arrive at the same time here, right? So they add maximally, okay? Now, the only way that I can reliably do this is by measuring the response with, you know, the normal polarity for the crossover and then reversing the polarity of one of the driver. And if they really add maximally here, then I should get a deep null. Well, and, and so I electrically, since I work with, with electrical crossovers, uh, I put a little bit of delay usually in the tweeter to, to get it right. But, and, and yeah, I really don't, 
I really don't like this idea of step baffles because now you have more diffraction effects there. I'd rather do the correction electrically. Okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.